This morning, our passage comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now, communion is an opportunity to reflect and remember the death of our Lord. His death is not one of a martyr, but one of sacrifice. Common misconception is he died trying to lead a revolt against the Romans. No, he willingly put himself to death, put his hands in the hands of, sin of sinful men and crucified him. They did seek to kill Jesus, but it would not have occurred if he did not allow it. The, the uh, gospels are replete with information about how he escaped from their attempts to kill him. And he only allowed himself to be known where he was going to be, to be captured and to be tried. And he instigated and he also orchestrated the events of that evening. This was a murder, but relented to by Jesus. They killed him. They murdered him. But he's the one that permitted it. We do not mourn him because he is alive. I know sometimes the death of Jesus Christ, the thoughts of him being on the cross for our sins, sometimes creates an emotion of sadness. But it's not a, an emotion of sadness that should dominate, but rather an emotion of gratitude. To know what he did for us and to be thankful. See, we have a hope in Scripture that teaches us not to look toward the return of who he was slain, but actually his return as one who is alive evermore. The beauty of truth is that Jesus Christ is not still dead. He died, but he's alive. So therefore, do not grieve, remember. Remember the glorious sacrifice. Remember his love. Remember that we are children of God in light because of his gift. This morning as we partake, remember. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word that we can glean from so many places throughout your word to receive the same kind of information and the same details of what we're supposed to understand about who Jesus Christ is. God in the flesh, died on the cross for our sins, rose again on the third day, ascended to heaven, and he promises eternal life, a gift, free, not of works, not of effort, not of promises, not of our fidelity. We are saved not because of who we are, but because of who you are. If one simply believes it to be true, understands that information and believes it, considers the information true, we are now sons of God. And we do. We thank you for that. We praise you for you are our God, our Savior, our reconciler, our sustainer. And we can't wait for your return. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gentlemen. First John chapter 1. We're continuing on with the introductory moits, and I'll have a few opening statements to make about this as well because it's I think, important to understand what we're doing but just to read part of the text verse one what was from the beginning what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life and the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So we're in the process of answering the 12 questions. It's our pretext work. It's, it's, the, it's the work that we do prior to getting to the actual interpretation of the passages. Everyone wants to jump ahead to the most difficult portions or the controversial sections, but we have to take our time making sure that we do our pretext work. And what this does is it addresses presuppositions. Now, if you are unlike every other person in Christendom, 
and you can read the text without presuppositions, then honestly, you don't need much pretext work. You just let the text speak. However, especially with certain books, there is a lot of presupposition, meaning you already come into the text with thoughts of understanding based upon what you think the book is about or what you who you think it's to uh, or various different contexts. As you will see, as we develop the actual book itself, when we get into the passages, I am going to take you through my process a little bit in detail in certain areas where we will address common interpretations. For example, when I get to 1 John 1, 9, we are going to address what is known as rebound theology. We are going to address whether or not this is a evangelistic verse. This has become popularized now that they, they believe that 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse them all in righteousness is evangelistic in nature. We have to address that. So when I go through my process, okay, I'm not sure if you remember, if anybody took my class on hermeneutics, my process includes writing down potential interpretations and then either, and either refuting them or confirming them. Because there are so many different interpretations of this book, we will do that too. So, but my goal is to help you not only to understand this book to the best of your ability, the best of my ability, but also as a demonstration of how you should do your Bible studies. We have to be able to address the problems that are, that are found in scripture because of bad interpretations, honestly and effectively, not through pre other presuppositions. Our presuppositions may be right. How do we know them? Okay, so concerning the author, what we've done so far, the main takeaway is that the author is unknown, but we know that the same author is the Gospel of John. Now, I can say I am 80% sure it's John. Is it possible it's a different apostle? Yes. Is it possible it's someone else? I would say on the outskirts, there is a possibility. I do not agree, but at the same time, I think it's, it has very little to do with the interpretation other than understanding the authoritative nature of the text is actually God breathed. That's the importance of it. What we do, I believe, understand is granted is that the, the author speaks as a eyewitness that has been there from the beginning. And he speaks with authority. And it leads me to conclude that the author is, in fact, an apostle. Concerning the audience, again, is unidentified. We don't know where these people are. We don't know how many people there are, are referenced. If this is a regional letter or a specific letter to a sp small body, there are no uh, particular individuals mentioned at all, unlike 2nd and 3rd John, which I find peculiar. However, we do know some information about them. They are believers. So this is written to believers. They are not eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. They have multi-generational believers. This does not mean you have a 90-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 10-year-old, a 5-year-old. That doesn't mean that kind of generational. I mean somebody who was witnessed to by the apostles, and they were witnessed to by the people who were witnessed to by the apostles. So multi-generational in that regard. They can be older or younger than the person that they were led to Jesus by. doesn't matter. That multi-generational means apostle, first hearer, second hearer, third hearer, that type of thing. They have a significant doctrinal issue and a perpetual admonishment is in this letter about the fact that they've let go of their original understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Even though there is a severe heresy in their midst, they have not ceased being children, beloved and brothers. In the end, the author confirms them as overcomers, not because of who they are but because they believe in Jesus Christ. And at the end, he tells them that the things that he's written, primarily in chapter 5, are written so that they would know that they have eternal life. Not wonder, not guess, not hope, in the English sense. But know that they have eternal life. 
The next question of our 12 questions is when. Now, when is a question that is honestly, I think, more important than what other people give it credence to. And, and the overall, again, if, if you can eliminate your presuppositions about 1 John and you just read the text and deal with the text only without dealing with all the noise, fantastic. You're one of the few. However, like me, I like to know more context. I want to know as much as I can based upon what I can read to understand this question. However, there are many, and I say many, I mean most. And I say most, I mean 98%. I say 98%, I'm making that up, it's probably closer to 99. Most people who read 1 John approach 1 John from a particular perspective in dealing with the when. The when is a, a very important concept, content. Why? Because of presuppositions. If you believe what most people believe about 1 John as to when, it also, it also impacts the purpose. And that purpose statement that most people have impacts every single <laughs> chapter when it comes down to your interpretation. What are, I'm going to show you how this works. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what is the predominant view? The predominant view is that this is a late book, 85 to 95 AD. Where do they get that from? Where is the source of that information? It is extra biblical history. When I say history, I mean the gatekeeper's history. There are gatekeepers in, in, in Christendom. You realize this, right? That there are people that write the histories and they are the ones who say what we need to know. Now, if the Bible wanted us to be specific about the time, can they do it? We were learning in Daniel. We know the year when Daniel was being was actually taken into captivity. We know the 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 year. That's crazy. And yet in 1 John, the author does not seem to want to, does not indicate the exact year of things happening. He could have said in the fifth year of, of Nero, could have done that. He could have said two years after my 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 uh, encampment on he could have done that. He did not. What we do know about the date is that Gospel of John and 1 John are tied together, which means if you believe <clears throat> that John, the Gospel of John, was written late, then 1 John has to be written later because John is the foundation. 1 John builds upon it. So you can't have 1 John written before John. Now, so we have to go back and have a little fun and go back to John. Was John written in 85 to 95 AD? That, if you look it up, look it up in your biblical commentaries, you look it up in secular commentaries, and I, I don't, I'm talking about the crazy people that say, oh, 300 AD, not those people. I'm talking about conservative people who say John was written, they will say 85 to 95 AD and first John after it. It is widely held that John went to Ephesus late in life and died there after his exiles, exiled to Patmos. Patmos, by the way, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, in which are Jesus, was on the island called Patmos. Why? Why was he there? Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He didn't go there as a missionary. He went there as exiled because he wouldn't shut up. Okay? So, if he was to write the letter of John, the gospel of John, and the letter of 1 John after Revelation, that tells us the Gospel of John and 1 John are written after this book. Do you understand that? Now, I think it is possible that 2nd and 3rd John were written after this book. But I have a little bit of an issue if you think that John was written before, after Revelation. That seems a little out of order to me. Are there clues? What am I doing here? There we go. Eh, same ones. All right. Are there clues as to when John, not first John, John was written? Because if John can be established as when it was kind of written, then we can have at least a little bit of indication as when first John was written. At least get a, get a timetable from there. So John... Um, seems to indicate 
from the internal evidence that John was written much earlier than traditionally held. John is typically understood as being written, again, 85 to 95, which means post-exile of John, post-destruction of Jerusalem, post-destruction of the temple. That's when John is normally thought of being written by most people. Are there ev evidences to the contrary? Yes. The, see, first and foremost, the gospel is silent on the destruction of the temple. In, in other words, if he's going to address the temple in the text, he would normally refer to the temple as in the past tense, or he would say something that would refer to the temple as no longer being there. Like, for example, when, when Jesus was confronted at the temple, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will rise up again. And when he rose from the dead, so it's obviously written after those facts, his disciples remembered that he said these things and believed. He could have added in there, by the way, the temple is also destroyed. The temple, which was, he could have said something like that. He does not. So the, the gospel is silent on the destruction of the temple, even though it's referenced 13 times in that account, the temple itself. Secondly, language clues. This is why syntax is important. John 5, 2 says this. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethsaida, having five porticos. What, what, what word is important is there is a pool this word is i me and it's in the present indicative if it says after 70 ad what's no longer there this is gone and so a proper trend a proper recording of this was would be there was a pool there is a pool means that according to the author it's still there according to his knowledge there are several times in which things are referenced in the past tense when they're being recorded as historical fact. Next is John chapter 11, verses 47 through 48. The chief counsel in consideration of Jesus Christ doing all these miracles. Here's what the author records. They they convened a council, and they were saying, what are we doing for this man is performing many signs? If we let him go on like this, all the men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. It had been very simple right there, and they did. <laughs> Not recorded. So there's a fear recorded amongst Israelis, especially amongst the chief priests and leadership, that the Roman overthrew, overthrow was a very real reality if they stepped out of line. But the author did not record that happening or refer to that happening. AD 70, actually between AD 66 and AD 70, Roman occupation, <clears throat> armies coming against them, the 10th Legion were pressing in on Jerusalem. They were fighting them off. When, and after 70 AD, wiped out. So it's very unusual for a book to be written 15 years to 25 years after those events and record them as if they had not happened. That would be very intricate in the details that Jesus Christ said concerning the temple as well. This is also why I believe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written prior to 65 AD because most of these events that they talked about had not yet occurred. Otherwise, they would have simply said, and it happened. Jesus said that, and it happened. They all referred it still as a prophetic utterance concerning the temple and destruction of Jerusalem. So the fear of the Roman overthrow is a fear, not a reality. Fourthly, now this is the weakest argument, is Galatians 2.1. Galatians 2.1 and it's supposed to be in uh, Galatians 2.1 and also Galatians 2.9. Um, basically, after an interval of 14 years, Paul went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. And in verse 9, it refers to James, 
Peter, and John as pillars. Pillars of the faith, pillars of the church, pillars of the body of Christ. They're pillars. John. Why John? Now, I suspect, this is my opinion, okay, John already being a pillar, um, I believe it's because of what he wrote. I believe because of what he recorded. He's not recorded in Acts as doing anything. Peter's recorded as doing something. Peter also, I believe, also has written possibly his first letter, has become very prominent within the council. John's never recorded ever speaking in Acts. Why is John a pillar? Why? Because I believe that he was one of the main voices and it was already established as one of those main voices. And when the voices are prominent, they write. So that's this is my loose understanding, not full evidence, but I believe it is evidence. So I believe the fourth gospel was written prior to 8065, and I think much earlier, probably from Jerusalem and could have been within a few years of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's no reason to presume that the, author, that the authors, Matthew specifically and John specifically, Mark and Luke are different cases, right? We understand that. Matthew and John were eyewitness testimonies. No reason to go, hey, you know what? Let's go ahead and wait 20, 30, 40, 50 years to write down the events. Why would they do that? Now, is it true that in church history, some people said that this is where he wrote something from? Sure. But I don't take that as scripture. And I don't have enough evidence to combat what I read in scripture as timing. So if we conclude that John is the author, not substantiated, but evidence does support, then by 45 AD, because I, I hold the earlier date for Jesus' crucifixion around 30, 45 AD, John was seen as a strong figure and had both respect and authority among the believers. My opinion is that John wrote the gospel between 35 and 45 AD. Now, how does this impact the writing of 1 John? When, when was 1 John written then? How does that impact it? Well, because 1 John is tied to John, typically it is held that since John is late, 1 John is late. So John, I believe, written early. Does that mean that 1 John was written right after this? Not necessarily, but it doesn't eliminate it now. If John's written late, 1 John has to be written late. But because 1 John, I believe, is written earlier, I believe that this does in indicate that 1 John could be written earlier. Is 1 John also early? I believe that we can demonstrate that it is. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, what do we have? What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes what we looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. If the later dates are true, 85 to 95 AD, what does that what do we know about the apostles by that time that I think is pretty well established in history? They're all dead. How can he be referring to the group that saw if he's the last one who saw? So the writer is representing a group. Who is he representing? Now, what, some people who hold to a late date know that he can't. They go, well, he can't. Th this is how they start out. Kind of strange. He can't be referring to the apostles. So, wait, why do you presume that? Because they hold to an automatic assumption of a late date. So who else could he be referring to if not the apostles? They would say the apostolic community of people who saw along with John. John was very young, by the way. I'm not sure if you remember this or not. As one of the eyewitnesses, probably between the ages of 13 to 15 years old at the time of drop your nets and go follow Christ. Young, okay? By the time of this writing, if it's early, he would still be in his 20s, possibly early 30s. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. Who is he talking about? Who is the us? Who is the they? Well, 
I'll, I'll let you know now, especially early, uh, you, you don't have Gentiles hanging around the apostles claiming to be part of the apostolic community. You have Jews, Pharisees, people of high rank joining up going, yeah, we're believers in Jesus too, joining in, sounding the same, and all of a sudden they leave claiming apostolic authority. And the only people we have in record in the Bible as people who claim to be what? Apostles who are Jews. Paul warns about these individuals coming to Crete, coming to coming to various different locations, claiming to be having an authority from James, even though they did not receive it. This would be a very strange statement to make if the apostles were all gone. How would they leave? Now, some people say they left in spirit. Um, they left. This, this language supports that they basically got up and left the council, demonstrating that they're not really from us. 1 John 2, um, 2, 23, whoever denies the son does not have the father. He, the one who confesses the son has the father also. What is the primary heresy in 1 John? It's a question that the Gospel of John addresses. Who is Jesus? When you get to other books, okay, um, especially doctrinal books, Galatians, Corinthians, Ephesians, the question is rarely addressed, who is Jesus? Now, sometimes you do have Christological passages, Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, and these are later books. But they only address it very briefly as kind of like a, a, a prelude or just basically a benediction type of information, not trying to correct heresy, but simply just admonishing or not. Sorry, I always say that admiring God for what he has done and who Jesus Christ is. First, John addresses him going, you have people saying that Jesus is not the Christ. Is this an early problem or a late problem in Christianity? It's an early one. First John chapter four, verses two through three. By this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've already heard is coming and is already in the world. There was the spirit of Antichrist claiming that Jesus is not from God, is not of God, is not, of, is not the Christ, is not yet come. The Christ has not yet come. Who says the Christ has not yet come? Especially first century. Jews, typically. Non-believing Jews. You're not going to have a Gentile Corinthian going, hey, the Christ has not yet come. They wouldn't use that language. It's not who they're talking about. So, the main theological concern, who is Jesus, is not a late concern. Once you get to the later books, it's about other questions. What do you do with the law? What do you do with the Gentiles? What about circumcision? Uh, what about the eschatology? Those are the questions. Those are the controversies. This information, I believe, demonstrates that the, the problem in 1 John indicates early. When? I believe it is, it's as early as 45 to 50 AD. That would make it contemporary with James. And I also, as I taught in 1 Peter, I believe contemporary with 1 Peter. I don't think it's any later than 55 to 65 AD, um, which means that this is before the exile of the apostles. Remember, at the first scattering, after Stephen's stoning, Christians fled. All the believers that were in Jerusalem fled, except for the apostles who remained in Jerusalem. Now, they did travel but their home base was still in Jerusalem. They did not leave. They didn't leave until James was booted off the pinnacle. And they go, James was the leader of that group in Jerusalem. Once he was killed, uh, they, they kind of got the idea, hey, we're all on the chopping block. And that's when they all began to scatter as well. So relatively, I believe it's early. Relatively to what? To what is typically held? I believe it's I believe it's written prior to um, AD sixty five and probably earlier than that, between forty five and fifty. What does all this indicate? 
Well, for years, the presupposition of 1 John is that it was written late from Ephesus and to battle Gnosticism. Okay? I'm missing slides. Hold on a second. I'm going to scroll through this real quick. Okay, here we go. They believe that they were battling Gnosticism. Here's a quote from a very popular commentary. In 1 John, readers were confronted with the error of Gnosticism, which became a more serious problem in the second century. Um, what do they mean by a more serious problem in the second century? It became a problem in the second century. The first century, it wasn't a problem. This was not the question, okay? Is there some pre-Gnostic views? Yes, but it was nobody, nobody held to it. It didn't become a problem until second century. What is Gnosticism? As a philosophy of religion, Gnosticism held that matter is evil and spirit is good. The solution to the tension between these two was knowledge or gnosis, through which man rose from the mundane, the physical, to the spiritual. In the gospel message, this led to two false theories concerning the person of Christ. Docetism regarding the human Jesus as a ghost. And Serinthianism, making Jesus a dual personality, at times human and at times divine. Well, okay, is that true? Is this true about Gnosticism? Yes. Here's what, I, if you want homework, here it is. Read First John and tell me where he addresses this. Just read it. Where does he address Jesus? You people think that Jesus was sometimes spirit and sometimes flesh. Where, where's that written? Where is this being confronted? So what happens is people go into the book of 1 John and try to reinterpret some of these passages trying to answer Gnosticism. And they force an interpretation based upon their presupposition of what they think John was addressing. I don't know about you, but when there's a doctrinal hold being being disputed, when there's something that is being that is blasphemy, that is heresy, doesn't the author come out directly and say, you, you're, you're holding to that? That's wrong. Right? Whether it be morality or doctrinally, the authors do not hold back as to what they're addressing. For first John to be written from the perspective of a the secret. Gnosticism that people say they call it a secret Gnosticism something that's crept in and it's undefined You don't think John can define it. Hey, you all are thinking something about weird about Jesus. You need to stop it No, he says what's the problem that there are people saying what? Jesus is not the Christ not that Jesus is some type of spiritual thing They're saying he's not the Christ. This is a simple refutation So I believe again that this book is relatively early, as early as 45 to 50 AD, but I do not think it's any later than 55 to 65 AD. And I think it's not addressing Gnosticism. I think it's addressing a simple heresy, claiming that Jesus is not the Christ, that Jesus is not from God. Now, where? Where did the author write this book? And again, we only have one clue to this one. So that's very simple. That's 1 John 1, 1 through 4. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. And we have seen and testify and proclaim, we, 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 to you the eternal life, which was from the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father. Our, our fellowship is is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. He is speaking for a group. Which group? Apostles. Where were the apostles headquartered? Jerusalem. We know this, very clear. Were they ever recorded as ever having a second headquarter? Well, Antioch. Antioch was not a headquarter for the apostles. It was a headquarter for a growing church group, 
but it, and, and including Jews and Gentiles, which was part of the confusion. But when there was a problem there, where did they go to resolve their problems? Jerusalem. So following the logic, it's written early. Following the logic, he's speaking for the group. I believe this letter was written from Jerusalem. All the apostles are being spoke for at a central location. I do think it's written from Jerusalem. Is it possible he's just speaking kind of like together in spirit? Yes, but I think that'd be very unusual language to do so, um, considering that they often spoke for other people when they're with them. Now, let me be very, very clear about this. When and where become less important if you can remove the presuppositions when studying this letter. If you can remove the presupposition of Gnosticism upon this letter, if you can remove that John was a was was after the book of Revelation, because sometimes people put the contents of the letters of Revelation into this book as well. OK, if you can remove that. You can almost ignore when and where as unimportant. However, you're going to have you're you're going to run into commentaries that because we know this is addressing Gnosticism, then this verse means this perpetually. So you have to understand the reason why we do it. We we have to address the problem. Now then again, coming to the next question, which is what was the occasion of the letter? Meaning. What prompted the author to write? Like if you ever written a letter, you usually have a purpose behind you. Like, like something hits you. Like you get a phone call, you get a letter in the mail, you see a problem and you write it. Or you're writing an encouragement letter. Hey, this person needs some encouragement. Let me write a letter. You do that with texts, right? Now the purpose and the occasion will be connected, but it's not always going to be the same. So this is why we separate occasion and purpose. What was the occasion? Now... History tells us Gnosticism, which I've already hopefully refuted. I think the text indicates something different of what caused the writer to write. I think that's 1 John chapter 2, verse 24. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. So if he is saying that, what happened? That which they heard from the beginning is not abiding in them. They are allowing other doctrines to come out. So you get word. Hey, did you hear about such and such a group? They have a group of teachers up there teaching that Jesus is not the Christ and they're tolerating it. John goes, where's my pen? <coughs> That's it. That's basically it. They're not abiding in the truth. So therefore, John writes. If you read John, second and third John, what's his main, what's his main thing? I am happy to see that you're abiding in truth. First John is, you're not abiding in truth. Okay. So the recipients have fallen into heresy, specifically the heresy of Jesus not being the Christ. The simplified, so so that's the simplified understanding of the occasion. That's what happened. That's why he picked up his pen. Now, as to the purpose, I think we can. There's first John is unique because self-identified purposes are abundant in the book of First John. What I mean by self-identified, First John chapter one verse four. These things we write. So that our joy may be made complete. Now we're going to talk about that when we get there, but that kind of sounds self-serving, doesn't it? I'm writing to you so that you get fixed, so that we're happy. It's basically it, right? But that's one of the purposes for he's writing. I, we're, we're trying to correct you so that we can be happy. But it's also First John chapter two verse one, which is a problem. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Hmm. I, what? Don't we sin? Why would he? 
Why would he, why would he write to them with the purpose that they would not sin? It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? Hey, I'm coming over here today so you, so you would not sin. You, you look at me and go, good luck with that. You'll be unsuccessful. Do you think that John is writing something with the intent of being unsuccessful? Interesting. We'll come to that. We'll ask the question. There's also another one. 1 John chapter 2, 26 through 27. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as he has taught you, you abide in him. So he's writing these things because you're they're trying to deceive you and they're being successful in some aspects. And so he's writing to them so that what was taught from the beginning would abide in the recipients. Purpose. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. The question here is, by the way, a little preview for this part. Is this talking about the rapture? Hmm. We'll talk about it. See, it's still introduction, so I get to go ahead and keep on teasing you. The final, these things we write, or these things I have written, is 1 John 5.13, which we should know well. These things I have written to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, here's a quick question. If you want to know that you have eternal life, what passage should you read? My suggestion, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Just in case read that over and over. Understand it. Study. Get it. Then you will understand what he's talking about. Now, some people think, take this as the overall purpose statement for the entire book. That cannot be. At the very lengthiest, it has it goes back to chapter 3, but I don't think it goes back to chapter 3 of the, these things I write in this section. I think it goes back to chapter 5, verse 1. But there, So you got to be very careful. This is not the overall purpose statement for the entire book. It's simply of a, a particular section. Even with those self-identified, there are other potential purpose statements in the book. And so in, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, it says this, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You read that and your head is swimming already, Right? You read this and go, what are you talking about? Because it's like a riddle. Right. Why? Because John is what? Because the writer, so I guess the writer is what? He's, he's trying to get you to think. He's not always telling you exactly what you need to know. You know what you need to know. Think about it is basically how he's talking about it here. But he's pointing out the fact that he would understand the commandment. We'll talk about the commandment in just a few verses. But let's go ahead and go down to chapter 2, verse 12 through 14. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the father. <coughs> verse 21. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who have been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Sorry, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie is of the truth. He is writing to them to remind them of what is true. You know what's true. I'm reminding you of it. It's a purpose statement. Chapter 4, verse 1, very interesting purpose. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. People get confused over this word spirit here, by the way. He, he tells them the, the why. So the spirits are tied to the messages, the false prophets and the true prophets. 
What are the commandments that he spoke of earlier? The 10? First John chapter 3, 23 tells us the commandments. This is his commandment. That we love, that we believe the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. That's the two basics. By the way, that's still loving God because you're believing in him. When you believe him, you love him. You maintain belief, you're loving God, honoring him. But the love is also very important because in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. This concludes this, this entire section. This is the love chapter, by the way. Everyone likes themselves in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, read yourself in 1 John 4. I think this is a much better love chapter than 1 Corinthians 13. They're both good. I prefer 1 John 4. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. To reinforce the command to love and provide a true understanding of what the love is as defined by God. A lot. We covered when, we covered the author, recipients, when, where, occasion, and purpose. We still have a few more questions to go. Because we still need to talk about some of the characteristics of the letter. And why am I talking about philosophy and not just instruction? So we'll talk about that hopefully next week. We'll see how far we get. But that's question number 12, by the way, dealing with the characteristics of the letter. So, And I hope that you see the value in going through these, these questions on this level. Because if you have presuppositions going into the book of 1 John, it will impact how you understand these passages. And we need to do our best to put out, put away from ourselves extra biblical presuppositions. If it's a biblical presupposition, if it's something we can validate as to the purpose and to the reason, that's a great presupposition because it's biblical. If it's extra biblical, something that we cannot validate that comes from some type of secular history or even church history, we got to be very careful that, that that does not pollute our understanding of our of our text of our work. Okay, if you have any questions on this, I, I beg you reach out and I'll help you. I'll, I'll help you and guide you through this these questions to the best of my ability. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Holy Father, for your Word that we can study, and it is such a vital importance that we understand who you are better. And to put aside um, anything that has been tainted from our our own thoughts or from secularists or even from church history, even well-intended people who, who take outside information as just as important as the internal. Help us to be biblical above all things. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.